morning, everyone. And thank you so much for the uh, invitation to speak on this meeting. I would like to thank also our International Cardiologist Society for supporting the cardiac nurses and to our partner, AstraZeneca, for making this nursing forum possible. Next slide, Janice. My name is Anasita Fado, as I've already mentioned. I'm a nurse practitioner in the Department of Cardiology at the MD Anderson Cancer Center. And together with me in this presentation is uh, Janet Selly. You have already seen her. She's a genomic nurse navigator from Advent Health in Florida. Today, I'm going to present the role of the nurse practitioner. Janet will present the role of the nurse navigator in cardio-oncology. As we all know, cardio-oncology has gained significant momentum as a specialty. And cardio-oncology programs are growing rapidly, not only in large cancer centers, but in community clinics, as well as around the country and globally. This is the theoretical framework of a patient-centered collaborative cardio-oncology program composed of multidisciplinary team that provides care cardiovascular issues across the continuum of care, from diagnosis to treatment to survivorship. There are different models of cardio-oncology programs for different centers. One of the major challenges establishing a cardio-oncology program is finding the right clinical staff, particularly nurses, who have the training and the interest to work in this exciting specialty. Cardio-oncology nurses serve as a bridge in cardiologists, oncologists, and the professional team to provide seamless care to patients with cancer and current cardiovascular disease and their families throughout the cancer trajectory. From diagnosis and treatment, the survivorship and end of life care. Cardio oncology nurses have different roles from bedside nurses. Go back, Janet, please. Uh, from bedside nurses, nurse practitioners, scientists who conduct independent research, research nurses for management of patients in clinical trials. Nurse navigators, to name a few of the different roles of nurses. In this nursing focus session, we will share with you a description of the different roles of nurses in the cardio oncology program. Next slide, please. My charge this morning is to talk to you about the role of the cardio oncology nurse practitioner in a cancer center. The Department of Cardiology at MD Anderson, uh, so go back to slide, please, Janet. Yeah, I'll let you know when to advance, uh -huh. please. The Department of Cardiology at MD Anderson has 13 cardiologists, six advanced practice projects, which compose of three PAs, three NPs, and a basic science physician scientist. Next slide. The role of the cardio-oncology nurses in a cancer center is multifaceted, as shown in this uh, slide. I will discuss some of the specific activities related to each of the role. One of the best things about working in an academic medical center is that we work very closely with our physician colleagues who are supportive of the work that we do. The nurse practitioner role allows a lot of flexibility and we share mutual respect with our cardiologists. As a nurse practitioner, we work both in the inpatient and the outpatient clinic. The cardiologists perform the initial consults 
and nurse practitioners do the follow-up. We have our own panel of patients in the clinic templates, separate from cardiologists and able to charge independently. Next slide, please. So the first role I'm going to discuss is the collaborative management of the cardiovascular issues in patients with cancer. As I mentioned, we do daily rounds in the inpatient setting, and part of our schedule is we also do clinic follow-up. In the inpatient, we do the management of cardiac medications, such as initiating and titrating heart failure medications. Also, patients on tyrosine kinase inhibitors, we initiate and titrate blood pressure medications to control the blood pressure. And for those patients on atrial fibrillation or with pulmonary embolus or DVT, we also manage the anticoagulation. When patients need diagnostic testing, such as stress testing, echocardiogram, uh, cardiac MR, or any kind of the tests that the team has decided for this patient, you know, like nurse practitioners can also order that. In the hospital, while patients are receiving chemotherapy, we monitor for the cardiac toxicities. In the outpatient clinic, patients who are cardiac survivors, particularly those who are adult survivors of childhood cancer, we do the surveillance for cardiac toxicities, which may occur later on in life, um, including those chemotherapy-induced cardiomyopathy, or those who have radiation to the chest that involves the heart, you know, and monitor them for radiation-induced heart disease. We also monitor the and manage the cardiac risk factors for secondary prevention to prevent any adverse cardiac events. Next slide, please. Also, nurse practitioners are involved in the coordination of care and care transitions. In the inpatient setting, when patients are ready for discharge, we make sure that they are followed up with their primary care physicians or cardiologists after discharge from the hospital. Particularly in patients with heart failure, we need to make sure that these patients are seen within seven days after hospital discharge. Research has shown that these patients who are followed within seven days can help decrease that readmission within 30 days after discharge. Also in the inpatient setting and in the outpatient clinic, we collaborate with the other professionals who are involved in the management of these patients. For example, if patients are, will undergo surgery, we assist with the preoperative evaluation or patients who will undergo um, treatment with cardiotoxic agents, then we did a pre-cancer treatment evaluation. Next slide, please. We are also involved in the quality and performance improvement. One of the major issues in the ma management of patients, particularly in patients with heart failure, is frequent hospital readmission. And in a cardio-oncology patient, frequent hospital admissions can cause cancer treatment delays, diminished quality of life, and an increased financial burden to the patient's family. So as part of that quality improvement, we did uh, do a clinical safety and effectiveness program and uh, evaluate you know, like the frequent hospital readmissions of our patients. Next slide. We published the results of that uh, program in the cardio-oncology and uh, please click Janet. After six months of implementing the quality improvement technique, the 30-day hospital readmission for heart failure was decreased by 23.4%. 
which is exceeding the target project goal of 10%. We have noted that frequent follow-up with either telephone monitoring, patient teaching, and follow-up when patients are at home, and follow-up in with a cardiologist or the primary care within seven days after discharge has helped really in terms of decreasing the readmission for heart failure. Next slide. One of the important roles of the nurse practitioner in the inpatient or in the cardiology setting, cardio-oncology, is patient and family education. Educating the family and the patients regarding the management will help improve the titration of medications as well as prevent hospital readmission. As part of the family and patient education, we teach patients regarding monitoring signs and symptoms, especially in heart failure, and when to show up in the emergency room or when to call their, their provider or cardiologists. Also, we are, are uh, participating in the education of nurses in cardio-oncology. At Anderson, nurses are well-versed in the oncology issues, but not in the cardiology. So please click, Janet. So these are our patient education materials, which we provide to the patient and the video, they can view it while they are in the inpatient setting. It's a 13 minute videotape and it's easy for them to just um, look at the video. And then at the end, we do a teach back. Teach back is wherein you ask a patient with a question that cannot be answered by yes or no, but this is to assess whether they understand what they were taught. So with this teach back method, we are able to identify which parts of the teaching the patient is deficient in, and then we can reinforce it. In the education of the nurses, we have a reference book. Please click that, Janet. Which is the cardiac complications of cardio cancer therapy. This was published by the Oncology Nursing Society. And this is based on the nursing process, which makes it easier as a reference for nurses in the clinical setting to have a highlight of the different cardiotoxicities. Also, in addition, we develop a nursing clinical cardio-oncology rounds wherein a cardiologist or an advanced practice provider will present a certain topic you know, for the first 30 minutes, and then two nurses, clinical nurses, will present interesting case studies, and then we discuss it with the input from the multidisciplinary team and the cardiologist on site to discuss further clarifications. So nurses are, it, this will help it actively involve nurses in the clinical setting. Next slide. The cardio oncology nurses also provide mentorship. Given that nursing, cardio oncology nurses do not have the fellowship like the physicians, the nurses learn this on site. So as part of the training for those interested in cardio-oncology, the nurse practitioners mentor these nurses, including the advanced practice nurses, physician assistants, as well as postgraduate students who are taking their DNP or a PhD degree. The clinical nurse leaders, which we have at MD Anderson, have more intense training to help train the clinical nurses at the bedside in terms of management of these patients. Research is also a component of the role of the cardio-oncology nurse practitioner. Uh, specifically speaking for myself, I'm interested in symptom management and the management of these and the use of these um, 
method to prevent further readmission. Next slide. As part of the research, in collaboration with Dr. Lenehan, we developed this MD Anderson symptom inventory heart failure. We did the uh, psychometric testing, and this instrument right now is used for data collection in clinical research studies, as well as we are using it in the clinical uh, Next slide. We further, we went and used the symptom assessment instrument to address the symptom management gap using the interactive voice response system. We did this in a pilot study and it has actually favorable results. But given right now with the advance in technology, the interactive voice response system is not as efficient as you know, like going into the internet. So part of the role of the nursing, cardio-oncology nursing, is to implement and translate research into practice. Next slide. So in summary, the cardio-oncology nurse practitioners serves as a bridge between cardiologists, oncologists, and the interprofessional team to provide seamless care for cardiovascular issues in patients with cancer. They also assist in early detection and management of cardiovascular toxicities, which are crucial for patients to benefit from life-saving treatments and provide a significant role in providing quality care to cardio-oncology patients, both in the clinical outcomes, improving patient experience, which is now a big deal in healthcare, and financial benefit to the institution. As, we have as I have mentioned earlier, nurse practitioners charge separate, can charge separately from the cardiologist, therefore contributing to the revenue in the department. So the presence of the nurse practitioner in a cardio-oncology program has a lot of benefits. Next slide. So as I can see here, you can see, this is a picture of MD Anderson where the heart is flowing. And across that is the Texas Heart Institute. Yeah, when we first started a cardio-oncology program, we had this picture to show the cardiac and the oncology, which is side by side. And I placed the hearts there because all cancer patients have hearts and cardio-oncology is an essential part of oncology management. Thank that's you. A beautiful, that's a beautiful slide, uh, Anna Sita. I love that. Thank you. And now Janet is going to talk about the role of the nurse navigator. Janet? Yeah, it's an, it's an excellent, excellent presentation. And also, um, I really loved the... Um, the readmission prevention is huge. That's uh, that's great, and the education materials that you have uh, presented are fantastic as well. So it's really, really great presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so really, I, I just wanted to say again, thank you to AstraZeneca and to ICOS and and Dan and Steve, really just for allowing the platform to uh, just share what the nursing role can be in this great um, subspecialty. So thank you um, to all of you again for the opportunity. The role of uh, the cardio oncology nurse in the community hospital setting is what I'm going to speak about because, as many of you know, I'm in Orlando in Florida. And Evan Health is a 1,400 bed community hospital in Orlando. It's one of eight. Um, in Central Florida, we've got uh, Apopka and Altamont and down near Disney World Celebration, uh, Kissimmee, and then Orlando. And we started our program in 2017 with a really generous grant from the Hearst Foundation. And specifically, they were just targeting breast cancer at that point in time and cardiotoxic chemotherapy 
to see if it would actually be a, a program that would be worth onboarding. So we aimed at monitoring breast cancer patients, and then in 2019, in July of 2019, um, I was blessed to be onboarded to this program, and now we have opened this up to anybody receiving anthracyclines or really uh, monoclonal antibodies, anybody in their journey or, or somebody who comes in maybe with decreased heart function that we didn't capture initially. So we now have about it's 394 patients currently. Um, it's always a moving target. Um, and we're follow, we followed over 560 patients since the outset of the program. So the program was established with a uh, cardiologist, a very engaged cardiologist. Um, it's a blessing to work with Dr. Guerrero. And um, oncologists, we actually have 20 uh, referring oncologists to our program, but we need, uh, we're need we looking for an oncology champion. So if there's anybody out there that would like the sunshine in Orlando, please let us know. Um, coordinating the care with, with me as the nurse navigator, and I also have a part-time um, navigator who does a great job as an adjunct. We started um, with the goal of getting people into the program and then actually doing the heart monitoring with 3D echo um, and global strain to detect the changes in, in heart function. So our sonographers are trained and deemed champions at the different uh, satellites in 3D strain technology. So we really have focused on the technique and the accuracy of making sure that these champions are trained and then yearly do proficiency training, just to make sure we've got the techniques down about uh, 3D and strain. And just to speak a moment about that, as many of you know, um, 2D echoes have been the standard for many cardiologists, but oftentimes there's education involved in appreciating the details in a 3D strain echo. For example, if I get someone into the program that has an EF of 50 to 55 percent, a cardiologist would normally not be concerned about those numbers. But if we do 3D and strain, it may be a 50 percent uh, ejection fraction and then a GLS of minus 17, it, at which point I would be very concerned about that. So it is important to have that 3D uh, strain whenever we can possibly get that. So our cardiology program here at uh, Evan Health in Orlando, the mission has been the same since the outset of the program. Um, we want to prevent or detect the uh, heart disease, and, and our goal is to make sure patients survive their cancer therapy without the likelihood of death from, from heart disease. So most of us watching know uh, much more about this than I have been learning. I've been a cardiac nurse for 33 years and um, started out briefly in oncology, but I'm learning much more. And we all know that anthracyclines um, came about in the 60s and we realized the cardiotoxicity risk with them uh, was a moderate risk in the 70s and 80s. And then with Herceptin therapy, um, many folks that are HER2 positive, 30% of our breast cancers will get uh, both therapies, which causes a synergistic effect and increases the cardiac toxicity. And then the other risk factors, obviously, that we all look for are um, people that have had former heart disease, people that are greater than 50 um, years of age. I, I'm not sure if I agree with that one at my age in life, but, um, and then prior radiation as well as Anacita had mentioned. Um, so how does this all come together? How does a nurse navigator fit into the cardio-oncology subspecialty? Um, I love this uh, drawing that Dr. Raphael Rascon had provided for ICOS. It's a great uh, vision of taking our oncologists and our cardiologists and really having it be patient-focused uh, and patient-centered and drilling down how the nurse navigator contributes to the subspecialty. I really believe the navigator works as a communicator between these very important specialties with the goal of enhancing seamless care and improving the outcomes. Our goal is to strive for excellence in patient care and make sure people have a, a, a good quality of life as they continue through after their therapy. So the current state of our program in Orlando, as I said, this changed a little bit. Um, we are following over 390 patients right now. 156 have been exited 
to survivorship and our survivorship program here in Orlando is just beginning. Um, so we're in the beginning stages of that. And then um, the other factors here, we've had patients pass away and some have actually moved out of, out of network. Out of network. <laughs> Um, and this is just another slide of the same components. We've got the active people in green, people that have exited in orange and then moved out of network and passed away. But the most exciting slide out of all of these is, is this one because I think this speaks to our mission. We've had 35 patients that we uh, have actually pinpointed in having a drop in their ejection fraction of 10% or more and then a drop in their GLS of 15% or more. And of those patients, those that have been treated um, with cardioprotective meds, we've had an 80% improvement in their heart function when we've watched them uh, over over time. So, I mean, this is really the goal of what we're what we're looking to do. So, our current program to drill it down a little bit more is a nurse navigator receives a referral, and that's me. I normally will get a referral through email. Um, we are leaning, we're shooting toward getting EPIC up and running by uh, 2022, but right now it is a, a written form that they have to fill out, so that is a barrier. Once I get that, um, I call the patient and we teach them the why about the echo surveillance program, if that has not already been explained to them, to make sure that they understand what we are doing in their care. And then we make sure that we give them our phone number in our office as a phone a friend, um, basically if they've got any questions along the journey. Even if it's not related to the echocardiograms or the surveillance program, I've assisted people in getting medications refilled, help them to reach out to their cardiologist or oncologist earlier than their appointments um, had been made for. So it really is just trying to be a bridge in, a, in an adjunct to, to make the care seamless. Cardiology reading panel at our um, facility. There's seven cardiologists that have dedicated their time to reading these chemo echoes within 48 hours of them being completed. And then once we do identify a decrease in heart function, we will let the oncologist know within 24 hours of that decrease and then suggest a cardiology consult or a repeat echo in six weeks. And then once the cardiology consult is obtained, we actually have worked with um, our cardiology group to ensure that 70, within 72 hours of that consult, we make sure that that patient um, has an actual plan for coming in to see the cardiologist. And then for the most part, we have strived to get the patient in to see the cardiologist within a seven day period. And sometimes that's, you know, life happens and sometimes patients can't come in on the scheduled date that there's an available slot, but um, that is something we're tightening up and, and working, working better on. So the future of cardio-oncology, if we look a little bit toward the future with it, what, what are we going to do to help collaborate with oncologists and help collaborate with cardiologists? We, we know um, oral treatments, as, as uh, many of you know, there's, there's uh, on a daily basis, it seems like oral treatments are becoming part of the chemotherapies that we're gonna have to monitor. So this is gonna be, I think, an up and coming field. I just had my first uh, Tegresso patient come into our program. And that is, that is something that I think education um, is important for patients as well as clinicians to appreciate that even though something's an oral medication, um, it, is, it is something that can be harmful and be cardiotoxic, um, even though it's not IV-based. So there's still a lot for me to learn as a clinician and for us to learn in the field about potential side effects of oral chemos, and that's uh, an exciting thing for us as well. So just to put things in perspective from Advent Health's service standards, we're wanting to, um, as nurse navigators, make this make it easy for um, our actual clinicians to be able to read the echoes to transition to electrical orders with EPIC. That's one of the things we're working on as a global plan, making it easy for um, our patients around all of Central Florida and really all of Florida in general. We're gonna be partnering with Moffitt um, in 2022 with research and I'm excited about expanding our program as we do that. 
Number three, we all want to be safe during the times of COVID, so making sure that uh, it's appropriate for patients to come in for their echoes. That's something the nurse navigator assists with if somebody's not feeling well or if they've tested positive. I'm an actual communication adjunct between the stenographers and the oncologists to help them appreciate why the patient didn't get their echo and we do need to reschedule. And then number four is just really growing our survivorship program, as I mentioned, um, onboarding an oncology champion that has the passion that Dr. Guerrero does from a cardiology standpoint. And these are just our final, my final thoughts. I just, um, you know, I know all of us have a plan and a purpose, and I'm, again, excited to just be able to be on this platform and to share what nursing can contribute to this exciting subspecialty. And if anybody does have uh, questions or suggestions, or if you just want to reach out and say hi, this is my contact information. Terrific. Thank you all so much. Are there um, questions or discussion, comments? Yeah, no, Janet and Anacita, thank you so much. Yeah, this is, this is really critically important to, to emphasize you know all of these all of these issues where you guys are describing how you make connections among different disciplines i can say that you know so i worked with anacita for about eight years so i know her really well and i also know that uh, she is just just like molly Rader, who works at washu with me now uh, really forms the glue for our whole group <laughs> And uh, I really think that that's, that's the part that, that we really have to have in order for a, any, any working group to, to actually function well. You have to have the glue. So I appreciate your guys' perspective. And uh, we need to keep finding, uh, finding different places where they have glue and uh, make sure that all of their programs are held together with that glue. So we appreciate your efforts. I trained with the hey, best. Hey, Anacita. <laughs> yes. Anacita and Janet, this is Vicki. Thank you so much. Oh, it is mm -hmm. so nice to see what good looks like. And both of your programs are so um, well-rounded and you've got research outcomes. I mean, really, that is what in my mind, cardio-oncology programs, you know, need to strive to be as good as MD Anderson's program and Advent Health program. So thank you guys so much. That was an excellent presentation. Uh, I hope, you know, like yeah, our presentation uh, provided insight into the role of the nurses, nurse practitioner, navigators, I mean, as well as clinical nurses to make the cardio-oncology program successful. Because my point, especially in terms of the nurse practitioners, if the nurse practitioners is able to do the follow-up, the physician, the cardiology, to do the job that they have been wanting to do, interventionalists, they can do their intervention. If they are like, doing uh, cardiac cath that they, and nurses or nurse practitioners can titrate the medications can follow up after that. And if there is a good connection between the cardiologist and the on -call and the nurse practitioner, yeah, like yeah, it's an easy thing for the cardiologist to just, you know, like uh, do their job and then solve them whenever we have issues. So I think Dr. Linehan can attest to that because um, when he was here at MD, that's how we set up the program here. Yeah, so, so glad, you know, that at the beginning he was here, who really values the role of the nurses. And it was developed from that, and we are continuously developing that. And when he is already somewhere, he left us. <laughs> Great. Hey, uh, I think Prince has a question. Yes. Um, thank you so much, um, Anisita Fedol and Janet. I think this is great. Um, 
what, what you've been doing is just um, really awesome. Um, I just have a few um, a, a question for you, and Anasida and, and Janet as well. Um, you did show a couple of um, resources that you give to the patient. I think that is great because like um, a lot of times they're just not sure why they are there because they just had cancer. They're already afraid. And now they're in a, in a heart clinic. So I think those resources are great. And the fact that you also do a lot of education for your for the nurses. My question is that are you doing any education for uh, training for nurses who are from other programs that are starting out and or any type of virtual mentoring for like nurse um, nurse practitioners or like um, nurse navigators who are um, in the um, start in, a, in new in new programs. Um, yeah, thank thank you. For the question. you know, like yeah, if you bring awareness to what you did in nurses for cardio oncology. First, you know your question regarding patient. It is, I mean, I believe you know, the importance of patient education. If the patients and the family are educated on what they need to do, it will make your life easy. For example patient you know, like uh, in that patient education I showed you you know we have a videotape where in the patients do it and then at discharge they are given that booklet as a reference and sometimes you know like it is if it's done at the teachable moment while they are in the it makes more sense to the patient especially in our patient population they have cancer and heart failure at the same time. It is so difficult. But as I mentioned about the when they view the tape, we ask nurse to go at the bedside and ask the patient a question that needs an answer, not a yes or no. An example is like say for instance, instead of saying, uh, do you know your medications? Say when your wife comes today, what can you tell her about the medications for heart failure that you're taking? So if the patient can regurgitate that, then he understood what the teaching is about. But if not, then you can reinforce it. And also, we gave that booklet as a reference that they can read at home. Yeah, as to the education of the nurses, I told you that I'm at MD Anderson, and nurses here are focused on oncology issues, but they are intimidated initially with the cardiology issues because you notice there's a different lingo for both specialties. So what we do is we do a RAMS. When Dr. was here, initially we do it on a basis. But then, as we progress further, more nurses are more aware of it. Then we extended it to every two weeks, every month, and currently we're doing it like every other month, as that round that I've told you. And then you know, on I further can... education in terms of mentorship, you know, like as I mentioned, nurse practitioners, we do not have a fellowship just like physician. So we do is for those nurses that are interested in the uh, specialty, then, you know, we mentor them. Yeah, the online mentoring I have done is for a uh, graduate student at Yale. I mean, she's doing her dissertation on cardio-oncology and it is done online. So what right now what I'm doing is I'm collaborating with the University of Texas Health Science Center School of Nursing here to, go, to develop a postgraduate or post nurse practitioner certification in cardio oncology. Yeah, they're still working on the curriculum, and maybe by the middle of the year, we'll have it ready for admission of students by the next school year. Oh, that's fantastic. I, I just wanted to supplement two things. Um, that was a, it's a really good question. Thank you for the question. And um, with, the, with the assistance of Vicki Chambers, we actually helped uh, a new program that's just getting started in a different state um, 
to really just share and collaborate with different people. And I'm uh, definitely open to continuing to do that because it is such a, a new subspecialty. The other thing I just wanted to supplement with was uh, we do have for education, we've got a roadmap that we actually um, give to patients just to help them understand and appreciate the why for the echoes in the program and then what happens if they do have a drop in heart function and then when patients exit our program we give them an exit letter and really let them know in the letter that it may you may have long-standing side effects so, so be aware of the cardiac uh, side effects if you are short of breath if you do have arm pain, chest pain that hasn't been there to make sure that you notify your clinician because it's just not after your treatment. It can potentially be longstanding effects. So we make sure that they appreciate that when they exit. Thank you very much. An additional comment for that is for those nurses that will be that are interested in cardio oncology, you can tell them to log on into the uh, ACC website in the cardio oncology section. And there is a cardio smart section in there which also includes you know like education materials for cardio oncology i have a awesome. question may i yeah. um, i'm agnes from bari italy cardio oncologist um, congratulations for your amazing presentations uh, both of you and uh, for your great job um, I have, i'm curious in your uh, daily experience do you think that um, a patient who receive a diagnosis of cancer uh, could they use this uh, as an option to change uh, their lives uh, to improve uh, cardiovascular factors uh, and um, uh, have a, a better uh, cardiological uh, surveillance or does it happen the opposite uh, the patients get uh, depressed and they don't Mm, don't control anymore uh, their uh, uh, cardiological risk factors. Thank you. That's a great uh, question. Thank you for that. And oftentimes, I would much rather have someone get into our program at the outset of the, the beginning of their therapy, because you're absolutely right. When, when someone um, has had a decrease in heart function or they're not feeling well or depressed, or there's so many factors, uh, psychosocial factors that that really um, are involved with the cancer patient. And you know, to say to them, eat well and exercise, they're, they're like, you know, oh my gosh, I, I can't even like get out of bed without feeling horrible. So it is an important um, it is an important role, I think, for the nurse navigator to appreciate where somebody is in their own journey and then to be able to um, provide teaching, education, and, and really the why for why we're asking somebody to continue heart health, to continue um, eating well afterwards to, to help with the progression of longevity. So it is a, it is a challenge um, based on the person's, uh, the patient's personality, but I do think that's where nursing can help um, assist as an adjunct and, and help uh, kind of meet that person where they are and then and help them grow from that point forward. Yeah, and I think a comment on that. Uh, in terms of the cardiovascular risk factors, you know, like, yeah, we have the primary and secondary prevention. And as you all know, when a patient with cancer is diagnosed in the 60s or in the 50s, that's the time when the cardiac issues also manifest itself. So because of cardio-oncology, we manage the cardiovascular issues to facilitate the patient to get the cancer treatments. And thereafter, after the cancer is in remission or cured, we need to manage the cardiovascular issues. I always tell the patient, you know, like quality of life is very important. What's the point, you know, like of curing the cancer when the heart dies? You know, like I always say, you know, I my argument here in the cancer center is it is the heart of the matter. Who cares about chemo if the heart stops? What's going to pump it? So it is very essential that we manage the cardiac uh, condition, both from the primary prevention as well as the secondary prevention. Great, Trent in Australia has a question. Trent, you wanna jump in? He's 
sorry, can't hear you. Your microphone may not be working, but he put a question in the um, in the chat box. He wanted to know, um, can you provide a little more detail on the DVD patient resources? Maybe just what's the content, uh, the outline of the content there? Yeah, the DVD is a uh, condensed, uh, I mean, condensed um, educational tool that highlights the stuff that is essential in terms of managing heart failure. And we also give it to patients who we think that potentially later on, they may develop cardiotoxicity because they were receiving cardiotoxic anti-cancer agents. So to summarize, you know, like yeah, the content of that includes why a low sodium diet? How do you look at the labels in the food? Uh, what are the signs and symptoms you need to monitor? When do you call the physician? When do you present to the emergency room? And in the low sodium diet, we list all the medications. A dietitian um, is, I mean, contributed to that section. They, there's a list of foods that are low in sodium, how to do grocery shopping. Yeah, rest and exercise is also included in there. So in the DVD, it only highlights those points because if it's too long, you know, like a patients will get bored. And then when they are, um, after finishing the video, we ask them these questions I asked you earlier in a teach back way. And then when they're discharged, they're given the booklet to take with them home for reference. Excellent, thank you. And uh, Veronica Santos in Brazil, did you have a question or comment? Hi, hi everyone. Hi, Anessi, and Janet, congratulations. I'm, my, my basic work here is a pediatric cardio oncology. Uh, I, have the, I had the, the pleasure to meet personally Anessi Fadal some years ago, and I'm very, very mm -hmm. happy that you were the first one who really uh, works in this area in promoting the education of nurses around the world. It's wonderful yeah. here in Brazil. We are very uh, uh, happy to start making such a kind of ed educational work in nurses' world. I'm sorry about my accent, but uh, mm -hmm. I think you both um, our mentors now in ICOS, and we are really following you in all aspects. And so I think we need just to make them more encouraged to to start working and studying in this issue sometimes they are very they are not very very don't have a, a lot of freedom to work and be more engaged in the issue as dr lenihon said you are the clue, the glue and the bridge for <laughs> us so let's work together congratulations i make just one question in the chat uh, space about the routine practice, uh, if you are, if, if you both agree that uh, measuring biomarkers in the routine practice is useful or makes a lot of work, increase, improves your job or not in our lives, what do you think? Thank you very much. Um, yeah, Veronica, thank you. You know, like I remembered you when we had the global academic. Uh, partnership meeting there in Brazil. Uh, before I forget, you know, like yeah, actually the in one of the sessions, there's a faculty in one of the schools of nursing in Sao Paulo who is translating and validating the Medasi HF in Portuguese. So I haven't heard from them whether it was finished or not. Mm -hmm. But to address your question in terms of biomarkers, here at MD Anderson, biomarkers are done in pre-treatment uh, of medications which are potentially cardiotoxic. Or if patients develop, you know, like a signs and symptoms of like myocarditis or an MI, uh, then the biomarkers are checked. And Dr. Lenihan championed the biomarkers here when he first uh, when he was here. 
And uh, like those patients, you know, like with heart failure, you know, like the anti-pro BNP. And sometimes in the follow-up, you know, with the survivors, you know, like uh, it is checked intermittently, but there is no protocol yet as to whether we should do it consistently in this patient population and in the survivors during follow-up. So I think further research is being done on it. And then I think when we have enough data, then it would be best if we develop these protocols. Because I think Prevent HF is another study that uh, is looking at it. Dr. Lenan, can you comment? Yes, of course I can comment. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was just muted, but the, uh, you know, Veronica, thanks for your question and gives me an opportunity to wax on and on about things. But the, uh, uh, we actually are developing or have developed, you know, sort of general uh, algorithms for how to monitor patients during different types of therapy. And these are not the only way to do it, but we're, we're doing them as, you know, sort of representing what, what we do at WashU. And uh, we've submitted those to the educational committee for ICOS for review and uh, to make sure that they agree with things. But ultimately, we, we would hope to make those available for everybody. <clears throat> but as Anaceta mentioned, the uh, certainly my view is is probably more bio biomarker centric than uh, than imaging centric, and I've I have been kind of on that bandwagon for many years. So I tend to do biomarkers more frequently than imaging, and I feel that those are those are tests that are generally not subject to interpretation. So you just have to figure out how to how to apply the biomarker information to the clinical uh, story that the patient has. So we we check biomarkers frequently, and I feel they're very useful. But and I've tried to do studies over the years to to demonstrate that they are useful. And if I can just add to what Dan and Anacita have, have already said, um, at, at uh, Event Health, we, we do not do biomarkers. However, there is, I, I believe there's a place for, for that for certain, because not every facility or every institution will have stenographers that are trained in 3D strain. It is, um, you know, in, in the United States, it's an expensive test, um, you know, to do the 3D strain echo and to compare apples to apples, I think is more important. Like if, if somebody is, um, does have the capacity to get biomarkers, I think that's an important thing to continue to, you know, to just gauge that as a patient's foundational um, norm and then, and then move from there. And um, not everybody can do um, the specificity of the, the 3D strain. And I, I, I do think biomarkers have a place in engaging somebody's uh, heart function for sure. Great. Colleen uh, Powers, I think you had a question. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Okay, so I, thank you for taking my question and that was a great presentation. I have two kind of specific questions for you. I am the nurse practitioner in cardio-oncology at the Toronto General Hospital. I've been in this position almost exactly a year. Um, we have the ability to see patients fairly quickly. We work quite closely with our colleagues across the street at Princess Margaret. And a lot of times we can see patients before they start um, anthracycline-based chemotherapy because a lot of those patients will be referred to our clinic to be uh, enrolled in specific trials that we have ongoing. Um, one thing that we haven't really done a lot of is to see patients at the time of diagnosis who may not be um, enrolled in a trial, so even seeing them on an inpatient unit. Is that something that either one of you have done in the past as a way of kind of bridging that link between cardiology and oncology in your own facility? 
I think, uh, you know, like, uh, Colleen, thank you for that question because it is important in terms of from the nurse practitioner as to, I mean, like, provide service for these patients. Yes, I mentioned earlier here at MD Anderson, all the consults by cardiologists. And then we meet with them and then we lay out a plan of care and the nurse practitioner does it. I mean, in terms of the follow-up. And we consult the cardiologist for any questions we have, and we update them also with uh, the change in condition of the patient. So knowing the patient with the cardiologist at the time of the consult will give you a, a good information of what the cardiologists are thinking and what their plan of action is in terms of the management of these patients. So a good communication with the cardiologist regarding this patient, whether they go into clinical trials or any kind of procedure in the trajectory of their cancer treatment will really facilitate, you know, like yeah, the improvement of care. And as mentioned, you know, the nurse practitioners are the glue. So, you know, like, yeah, when you see the oncologist, you can just ask them to, you know, like, yeah, or update them of the status of their patients. And then you go back to the cardiologist and tell them about, you know, like what's happening with the patient. And so during trials, if you suspect that the patient is developing cardiotoxicity, then you can immediately notify the cardiologist and, you know, like, yeah, you develop the plan of care, what needs to be done. Yeah, Colleen, thank you so much for your question. I assume you work with Dinesh. So if you if that's true, then uh, please tell him hi. Uh, I, I <laughs> work very as, closely with him, yes. Yes, so yeah, no, I am sure you do. Uh, I think that this has been really awesome and I hope that you know your group will continue to do periodic presentations for ICOS. We really appreciate it. and. However, we can help to to build the build the system around the world. That's what we want to do, and we really appreciate your effort. Yeah, we thank you both you. so much. And I think as Steve has planned it, uh, the next presenter will be from the international standpoint. You know, uh, someone from Canada actually is uh, presenting together with a nurse from the UK. Yeah. So uh, I do not know the specific date, but I think that's the next three centers. That's Super. Awesome. Yeah, next month. So all thank right. you next all month. so much. And next thank week you. we have a presentation on uh, pediatric cardio oncology. So we hope you can join us next week for that. Okay. Great. All right. Thanks, thank everyone. you all. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you.